I always feel that China is different, but after two keynotes and two panels of uh, very interesting presentations, I feel that um, China is, uh, I can't help thinking to myself that China is really very different from the rest of the world in 1958, at least. So you will see from my presentation how different China is, uh, China was at that time. Okay. So PCN, I'm talking about new mutual and politics, and um, PCN County is now called Pijou since 1992, is in Jiangsu province, marked red. Jiangsu province is one of uh, the most prosperous province in China after the, well, ever since ancient China, has always been one of the most pro, um, prosperous provinces. And I will follow, my presentation will follow this outline. Subjects of my study, background, reasons for research, resources, findings, and conclusion. And there are very few images that I can find um, from 1958. This one is one of the few images. And it shows that old lady Liang was painting a mutual with another old lady from her village in Pixian. Um, in broad strokes, I'm looking at the new mutual movement in PCN in 1958. In small strokes, I'm looking at mutual as a folk art, political intervention, propagandist funding, and state exploitation, the prescribed ideology and the folk ideology, and gender at work. And this mutual showing, this picture showing that the mutual um, painted by old Lady Liang, which we saw earlier, and this was a model mutual in 1958. Um, you can see the four tracks overshadowed by huge uh, ears of corn. Um, historical background of my study. In 1958, there was the Great Slip Forward Movement, a movement um, um, designed to transform agrarian China to industrialized and modernized China. And the consequence of this great leap forward movement was the three-year famine resulting in 30 million people um, dying of hunger. And there was also the collectivization in 1958 and also communalization in 1958. Um, political background, it goes back to 1942 in Yang'an when Mao Zedong made talks at the Yang'an Forum on Literature and Art. In this talk, he demanded that art should serve Chinese revolutionary politics. And he has a very well-known metaphor. In this metaphor, um, can, um, there was the army of soldiers and the army of writers and artists. And for him, the two armies were critical for the success of Chinese revolution. And the intellectual background goes back to 1931 when Lu Xun wrote a very short essay introducing Diego Rivera, Rivera's fresco, Night of the Poor. And in this essay, um, Lu Xun introduced public walls um, mutual painting and the social responsibilities of artists. In the scholarly background, there has been an emerging interest in studying this mutual movement in the past 10 years. And this image was from um, a book called Rural Mutual Reference Materials, published by Fine Arts Publishing House in 1958. It was a book um, showing how peasants, teaching peasants how to make mutuals and what kind of images they should make. And reasons for my research, I, I believe that this mutual, can, mutual movement was a very important phenomenon, but it's scarcely known because when I talk to people, when I talk to my colleagues about this movement, only um, a couple of them um, seem to know this. And it obviously it's inadequately studied, so my paper offers a critical examination of this movement. Resources, um, I'm, I'm using People's Daily, which is state-owned, um, the third organ of um, the Communist Party. It's like New York Times, but it's 
owned by the um, party. <laughs> um, Art Monthly, and also Rural Mutual Reference Materials. Um, secondary resources including journal articles, um, mainly in, written in Chinese. And this image shows you the, um, the mutuals painted on peasants' houses and look at how shabby the houses are and the mutuals are actually on very white walls. So my findings, um, the discourse on the new, well, when looking at the materials from 1958, you can see the standard vocabularies are like mutual, the mutual movement. And occasionally in some folk songs and um, some not serious po poems, you can uh, find new mutual and the mention of the new mutual movement. However, in current scholarship, um, like every scholar is emphasizing, this is new mutual, and this is the new mutual uh, movement. So there is an emphasis of the new. So I have some speculations about the emergence of the new in current scholarship. Um, I think in retrospect, um, the Maoist mutuals are very new in comparison to ancient mutuals. And these Maoist mutuals are also very new in comparison to Republican war mutuals. And uh, of course, there is like postmodern fetish of the new, as if only the new were uh, worth studying. And because the sporadic presence of the new mutual and the new mutual movement in 1958, so it was not a total in invention. And mutual as the preferred genre, um, in 1940, 42, in um, talks at the Yan Forum on literature and art, Mao defined mutual as a folk art. That was very important because folk art, the people's art. And then um, for mutuals, there is no reliance on galleries and museums in cities. And actually back in 1958, China didn't have many galleries or museums, not, to, not even in the cities. And the sim simplicity in form and content allowing access to the vast illiterate population in the rural, uh, rural China. Um, public walls, I'm using the quotation mark because normally when we, see, when we say public walls, we are referring to uh, like hospitals, um, um, post offices, libraries, those facilities owned by the government. Uh, or government-sponsored facilities. However, in this, um, in my study, the public walls um, were actually very private. Um, the mutuals were painted on the walls, uh, on the exterior walls of peasants' houses, and then um, the mutuals were painted on the interior walls and on floors, and gradually the mutuals intruded the most private space, the bedrooms of peasants. So um, I, the selection process, I tried to find support about how uh, the walls were selected because not, a, not every single wall was painted the mutual. So there was the selection process and there should be some political implication of the selection. Um, and obviously materials show that um, there was an emphasis on the class status of those um, peasants participating in the mutual movement. But um, so my speculation was the um, houses of rich peasants or landowners uh, from old China, th their walls were not selected. And payment for mutual space, there was no mention about payment at all. And there was only one place um, um, it mentioned that before 1948, peasants were unwilling to offer their walls for propaganda purpose, but in 1958, like almost every single peasant was passionate to offer their walls to be painted. And public funding um, comes in different ways, like um, Jiangsu province, PC and peasants are exhibition in Beijing, um, three cadres from PCN were trained in a class sponsored by Jiangsu Masses Art Museum, which was also in PCN. 
And some cadres working um, for, this campaign, for this movement were actually paid by the government. However, there was uh, various forms of labor exploitation, or we call voluntary labor. For example, there were 15,000 people participated in PCA uh, mutual movement, including children, carpenters, paper craftsmen, or paper cutting ladies. Um, some peasants painted their own walls during their lunch breaks, at night, or even overnight. Um, peasants also made, made painting materials using like the most natural uh, materials, like red flowers, green leaves, limestone, s uh, smoke remnants from chimneys, hog bristles, etc. They also uh, sold goose eggs and small geese to buy materials to supplement um, mutual painting. Um, payment for painting mutuals, um, I think I mentioned earlier already, and working credits from the commune. Because in 1958, um, all the villages were communalized, so peasants were working, earning work, um, working credits. And there was one place mentioning that after painting the murals, the, com the commune rewarded peasants with uh, working credits. However, those working credits were turned down by the peasants. That means peasants refused to accept uh, working credits because of their participation in the mutual movement. Um, women in most Aram politics, um, women were prescribed in rural mutual reference materials, and they were portrayed as illiterate, uh, wheat, cotton growers, housekeepers, and obviously there was the ideal most woman um, at the list of, in the rural area, for the rural area. Um, those women uh, should be able to read and write, and as peasant, they grow needed agrarian products for the country, like cotton and wheat. As wife, they manage household and so for the family. And in reality, um, women also participated in producing uh, Maoist ideologies. Uh, for example, old lady Leon, she was a model person during the PCA mutual movement. And she painted the mutuals when she was um, 72 years of age. And her class background was emphasized. Um, she was from a poor peasant tenant's family in old China, which refers to China before 1949. And she painted overnight with a bar lantern. I mean, when this was uh, reported in newspaper and a uh, journal article, there was no question about why she had to paint overnight and why um, um, it was not a question at all, but when I read this piece of information, I was like, how could a 72-year-old year old lady paint it overnight, and why did she have to paint overnight? <laughs> and, um, but this old lady was enlivened by the responsibility of publicizing the general guideline. The general guideline refers to the general guideline of building socialism in a faster, swifter, and more economic way like uh, producing, for example, the slogan, producing uh, steel and iron, um, surpassing Britain and America in 10 years. Um, her most famous mutual was the king corn we, we saw earlier, the four tracks overshadowed by the huge years of corn. So my conclusion, the new, in the new mutual movement studies, um, was actually, is actually a later scholarly semi invention. And mutual defined as folk art um, earned its legitimacy in Maoist China, but it intruded the most private space from the very beginning. And there was scarce governmental funding with uh, various forms of state exploitation of peasants, and women portrayed as role models. And in reality, women also participated in producing um, Maoist ideologies. So the mutual movement set out to educate peasants. However, it resulted in an exploitation of the peasants and an intrusion of their privacy from the very beginning. Thank you. <laughs>
A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this paper tries to constellate a post-war milieu in Southeast Asia, a geopolitical category of region shaped by colonialism and the Cold War. The gestures of struggling for independence, building a nation, performing the rituals of modernity, living with the tenacious legacies of successive colonialisms, and waging insurgencies as we speak, form the theater of this milieu. From city and monument making in Jakarta to neo-traditional Thai temple painting in Bangkok and on to socialist realism in Vietnam to sketch out some instances of practice within the tenure of the post-war. This presentation, however, is particularly interested in the conceptualization of the relationship between church and state as informing the tension that produces modernity and the modern form. In the 50s in the Philippines, two Catholic churches were built. The Church of St. Joseph the Worker at the Victoria's Milling Complex in Negros Occidental, an island south of the capital, Manila, and the Chapel of the Holy Sacrifice at the University of the Philippines an educational institution established by the Americans in 1908 in Manila. Both institutions, the Sugar Mill and the University, aspired to modern integration with the world economy through the export of sugar on the one hand and the production of supposedly universal secular knowledge on the other. The Sugar Enterprise initiated the country into industrialization and allow the native elite to diversify the sources of their wealth in other industries. And their need to secure overseas markets strengthened the ties of dependency and neocolonialism that have characterized modern Philippine-American relations. In fact, the same elite in the island supported the Americans in the Philippine-American War and wanted to secede altogether from the precocious Philippine Republic, which was the first in Asia. Secular education, on the other hand, in the University of the Philippines, placed its faith firmly in the, quote, truth unfettered by political, by social, political, and sectarian limitations, end of quote. The first president of the university, who was an American theologian, stressed the moral value of work and believed that, I quote him, the surest and quickest way of bringing about the Filipinization of government is through the university. The sugar mill, a capital-intensive facility and the plantation was a locus of accumulation, unimaginable inequity and profound feudalism, and therefore became the ground for social movements led by messianic religious figures and armed revolutionaries. For its part, the university pretended to the relative autonomy of critical thought and became the hothouse of activism and the radicalization of the youth in the 60s and the 70s. The Osorio family <clears throat> that owned uh, Victoria's Milling, which is said to be the largest integrated sugar mill in the country at present, commissioned the architectural firm Raymond and Rado based in New York and Tokyo, to design a church for the community of around 3,000 in 1947 as part of the scheme to consolidate its refineries in one area in the aftermath of the war. The nave and the sanctuary of the church were built on separate foundations and linked by movable beams. The architects conceived a simple earthquake-proof structure that employed concrete blocks made by the mill, laid as hollow piers, which then served as formwork for the reinforced concrete beams and roof. The materials used were confined to reinforced concrete and concrete block masonry, and the building, were, the mati and the building was designed to withstand natural calamities and the demands of a tropical climate. The requirements were also made to respond to local labor capabilities. The, the facade was decorated with a mosaic made out of shards from coke, whiskey, beer, and milk of magnesia, bottles sourced from the site. Sculptures of religious figures exhibited local traits, and the Stations of the Cross risked eccentric iconography. <clears throat> 
like Pontius Pilate and Roman centurions morphing into the constabulary of the day. The most prominent detail of the sanctuary would be the painting of Alfonso Osorio, known as the Angry Christ in acrylic. It swarms the altar and infests the ceiling and the beams. According to Osorio, the subject was worked out <clears throat> in terms of the main action that takes place in the sanctuary, which is a sacrifice of the mass. I had a large seated figure of Christ which, with hands open, supported by the hands of God, the Father, that came out of the blue. It is the last judgment. It's a continual last judgment with the sacrifice of the Mass, that is the continual reincarnation of God coming into this world. End of quote. One of the architects, Antonin Raymond, thought that this ornamentation was unfortunate, having obscured the natural concrete work. Uh, and the entire architectural expression. But for the Philippine art critic, Emmanuel Torres, it was a tour de force. According to him, using cluster <clears throat> images that destroy all notion of three-dimensional naturalistic space, fantastic, hopped up psychedelic colors, severe distortions of faces, and other parts of, anato of the anatomy, ambiguous shapes that suggest several things at once, flames, tears, waters, ovaries, sperms, lashes, mouths, in combinations that make the viewer feel he is beholding something that is not of this world, a spiritual frenzy or a profoundly mystical moment. Alfonso Osorio, the brother of the administrator of the mill, was an interlocutor of Jackson Pollock and Jean de Buffet. In fact, he was a patron of both artists, collecting Pollock's early work, and installing Du Buffet's Art Brut collection in his estate at the Hamptons, fabled for its conifer arboretum. He was born in 1916 in the Philippines, went to Harvard to study art, became a naturalized American citizen in 1933, and came back in 1950 to the Philippines to paint the large painting of Christ for 10 months. As a writer has noted, the fact that Osorio was born in the Philippines wealthy, urbane, multilingual, religious, gay, an articulate writer, critic, a formidable collector, might script him outside the muscular, all-American post-war art history that was the engine of critical appraisal in the 40s and 50s. At the University of the Philippines, the Chapel of the Holy Sacrifice was built in 1955. It was designed by the architect Leandro Luxin, who did, not, who did not leave the country to study architecture. The edifice was hailed as an achievement because the thin shell was molded astonishingly in its entirety using mere plywood forms and radically defied the transept as the key idiom of church architecture in predominantly Catholic Philippines and in a way repressed its colonial history. It consisted of a spherical dome with the main concrete shell supported by reinforced columns and was open on all sides. It was the country's first chapel in the round with an altar in the middle. It was adorned by the modern art of its time. The crucifixion with the dead and risen Christ on both sides of the cross, the abstract terrazzo floor piece, and the cubist stations of the cross. The church was commissioned by the Jesuit chaplain of the university, John Delaney. At the time of the construction, he was involved in the debates around the role of religious life in the secular environment of the university. Delaney challenged the dominance of Greek letter fraternities in student politics. The city north of the capital, Manila, on which the university stood, had been envisioned by the government as a new city developed by Philippine architects who were sent to the United States and South America to observe the architectural scene. After completing the project, Luxin moved on to become the main architect of the central business district developed by the relatives of the Osorios, designing its first building, its first buildings beginning in 1958, and the gated enclave of the elite called Forbes Park. Imelda Marcos, then asked him to do the brutalist cultural center of the Philippines in 1969. 
and other buildings on Manila Bay, which Madame Marcos reclaimed for a cultural complex to host events by the World Bank, the Group of 77, and the Miss Universe Beauty Pageant, which was first broadcast live on television from the Far East in Manila in 1974. These two churches in the Philippines offer ways to critically reflect on the post-war. First, the post-war meant reconstruction in light of the overwhelming, sorry, this is the Bakati, this is the um, business district in Manila, the gated elite enclave, Forbes Park, and the residents of Luxin in, in that village. So first, the post-war meant reconstruction in light of the overwhelming devastation and loss of lives in the Philipp lives the Philippines had suffered during the war, which was one of the most horrible in history. And this aesthetic of reconstruction may have been exemplified by the use of reinforced concrete as a material. Antonin Raymond expressed confidence in concrete as, and its plastic potential. As a critic of his practice would put it, concrete is a truly international material used worldwide. From another perspective, it is a regional material through the use of locally found aggregate and, and the techniques and ideals of its builders. Concrete as a liquid that becomes a solid can be further considered more a process than a building material. Raymond apprenticed with, uh, apprenticed for Frank Lloyd Wright and worked with him to design the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. That this Lavrado, who was his partner, who like Raymond came from the former Czechoslovakia, was a student of Walter Gropius and a peer of Joseph Albers. Raymond is esteemed in Japan as its first modern architect and did a seminal project for a spiritual guru in Pondicherry, India in the 30s. Here, I converse with the work of Aleka Lublanc on Brasilia and Atreya Gupta on Chandigarh for, for uh, focusing on concrete as, as material. Modern church architecture in different parts of the world look, look to reinforced concrete as the main material for its construction. In fact, it's key access to being contemporary, at once light and strong as opposed to the heft of domes and vaults. As Leandro Luxin would himself assert, forget steel and glass, concrete is our material. Concrete indeed was an, in, an index of modernity, internationalism, industrialization, and labor demanding plasticity, as exemplified by the Notre Dame du Rancy and the work of uh, Felix Candela and Pierre Luigi Nervi. Moreover, concrete was prized for its fluidity and lightness in spite of its exceptional tectonic integrity. Such an aleatory aesthetic related well with Alfonso Osorio's own protean sensibility. As Jean Dubuffet would evocatively describe the paintings that the artist did almost feverishly in the evenings in the Negros Island while he was doing the mural during the day, and I quote, grimacing or screaming faces, hands with fingers forming strange signs, excrescences, digitations, um umbilical depressions, viscera sprouting, filthy tufts of hair, hideous sexual organs, all seething with varicosities, leprosies, abscesses, end of God. It involved a process-intensive wax-resist technique, building up a rich vocabulary in layers of wax, black ink, water-based paints, and other drawing materials. Second, this procedure of Reconstruction was a coincident of liturgical reform that manifested itself quite strongly in church architecture. Such reform entailed efforts to bring the congregation into more active participation in the Mass. Its architectural effect is to bring priests and congregation physically closer together around the focal point of the altar. Paramount for Leandro Luxin was the urge toward community life and that the interior of the church should be oriented toward the Eucharistic sacrifice and not mainly toward devotion. This reform could only be animated by the art of the time. That's the place of modern art within its premises. Exemplary in this regard would be churches 
would be the churches of the period in Assi, Vangs, Villefranche-sur-Mer, and Ronchamp, which were decorated by artists like Matisse, Rouveau, Cocteau, and Le Corbusier. Third, this reconstruction may have touched a nerve or a vein of mysticism, a search for unity amid the fragmentation in the wake of the war. The owner of the sugar mill, Federico Osorio, wrote that, and I quote, there, has, there was then in 1946 the imperative to sow a seed whose incremental growth could heal not only the victorious community, but to show a function born out of weakness of the greater power which is liberated by humility for the reconciliation of Asia itself, end of quote. His brother Alfonso, the painter, would further elucidate on this desire for wholeness through the mediation of the human who is, according to him, the link between God and the material world, which is the whole idea of the sacrifice of the mass. It's all one kettle of fish, according to him. It is simply that it is all one unity. Even a little waste piece of plastic or a bone is just as much alive as the abstract concept of God, which is meaningless unless it is incarnated. For Osorio, <clears throat> this return to the Philippines was also a coming to terms with his troubled childhood, his sexuality, reading on the island, the Freudian Nandor Fodor's book on trauma and prenatal conditioning. The Philippines had also condensed for him an intolerant religious culture, in his own words, that had insulted and injured him and for which he was painting his relentless Christ. Furthermore, this incarnation of the spirit takes place as a performance within a church that is carefully crafted to stage it. Loxin's design for his church, for instance, harnessed the element of light. There are five shades of light in the cove at the interior base of the dome, white, green, red, yellow, and blue, with the intensity calibrated according to the time of day and part of the mass. Father Delaney was said to have instructed Loxin to design a, quote, completely open building that would provide a dramatic setting for the mass while symbolizing the eternal modernity of the church. In 1968, the avant-garde Philippine composer, Jose Maceda, exponent of music concrete in Asia, premiered his Pagsamba, or music for a religious ritual in the church, consisting of 100 performers, a hundred voices, and two gong groups to create at once stereophony, music, and malleable sound. Fourth, the post-war may have encouraged the creative formation of a humanist artist of broad sympathies, some sort of an allegorical figure, figure of completion or fulfillment. Alfonso Osorio possessed a robust intellectual disposition. Antonin Raymond painted did pottery, textile design, furniture, furnishings, lighting fixtures, garden design, and even played the cello to, in his words, achieve true integration. Leandro Loxin was a painter, taste maker, a collector of antiquities, and did set designs for Martha Graham in New York. More challenging to conceptualize in this paper is the tangent of church and state. In a paternalistic and patrimonial state like the Philippines in which the economy is captured by an oligarchy, and in a society so deeply tied to the colonial faith of Catholicism and its folk translations, the church and the state are difficult to disentangle. The priest who commissioned the chapel of the Holy Sacrifice, Delaney, had sought to put a stop the brutalities in fraternities and sororities and cleanse student politics and bring Christ and his principles into political life. Antonin Raymond, in his, in his autobiography, stated that the sugar tycoons had told him that one way to prevent the spread of communism on the island of Negros would be to imbue the people with an ardent religious spirit by reviving their interest in Catholicism, the reason the church had to be built. It is often imagined that church and state, nation and religion are antinomies, but the colonial government in the Philippines under Spain was for the most part a conflation of church and state. And at times when there was conflict, the clergy did not deem it impossible to assassinate the governor general, as what had happened in 1719. 
The discussion of the two Philippine churches tends to surmount the said antinomies in the context of, industri of the industrialization of the economy through sugar and the Filipinization of govern government through university education. The modern form may have been carved out from the interests of a political theology to encourage more collectivity in liturgy within, ar within an architecture that is attentive to a local and theatrical atmosphere and to convene a faithful that is bound in some kind of mystified unity perceived to have been torn apart by the war and subsequently threatened by forces like communism and secularization. It might finally be fitting to frame the discussion of the two churches in the 50s in the Philippines within a precursor and a possible future. In 1914, the Filipino Felix Manalo founded Iglesia Ni Cristo, or Church of Christ, a homegrown global religion considered by a scholar as the most successful form of indigenous Christianity to have arisen in the third world in the 20th century. Its creed rests on the prophecy of Christ's church rising in the Far East in the Philippines and radiating outward to the far west of the Americas and Europe, beginning in Hawaii. It built its first Gothic-like concrete church in 1948, which then evolved into a more elaborate design in the 60s. This religious organization is totally beyond the authority of the Church of Rome and votes during elections as a formidable collective. It is celebrating its centenary this year, and its grandest project takes us to another instance of architecture as a kind of political theology. It is the biggest indoor arena in the world, something that surely deserves another paper. Thank you. So my topic is, uh, is clearly stated there. Experiences during the Second World War shaped post-war consciousness in countries throughout the region um, that we're looking at uh, here, as did the emerging realignment of global power along Cold War lines. These two factors figure profoundly in art during the period under consideration, 45 to 65, although they do so as we might expect differently in each country. And in fact, this multiplicity raises considerable doubt about the emphasis on the modern in such inquiries, as if its degree or kind or time of occurrence was the primary concern, which it tends to be in most of the thinking about these, uh, about these issues. So I know that such a perspective, which has an inherent kind of Westernism in it, is the opposite of that of the organizers of this uh, conference. But it's very difficult when we try and formulate what we're doing to avoid it. For example, uh, I'm not sure whether Oak, we wrote this, uh, but when you said probing the different concepts of artistic modernity, such as abstraction, realism, figuration, and representation, the project will explore how receptions and formulations of modernism inform the manifestations of specific variants of modern art. Okay? So I think there's two things at play there. There's terms such as abstraction, realism, figuration, representation. And there's a level, I think, on which we, we have to rethink all those terms and add new terms about practice, particularly terms that actually emerge from what the artists are doing, that actually recognize um, a whole other series of, of things that they're doing. Um, for example, hybridity and, for example, iconomorphism, change in the nature of an image, mixing images from different traditions and so on. There's a whole series of specific practical terms I think we need to refigure. But also framing everything under the heading of modern or modernism. Um, particularly modernism is an issue that I'd like to unpack a little bit here and hopefully we can talk about a bit more. Because if you talk about a specific variants of modern art and receiving and formulating them, it does imply a structure of power that operates in a way top down. And given the fact that the two oceans had for, for a century and a half 
been theatres of European colonialism, and prior to that, theatres of Chinese and Islamic colonialism, artistic modernity was indeed the dominant dynamic and remains so during this period. So there's a power thing that we have to recognise. But it was never the only one and never, uh, was, was never the only one nowhere. Um, so my focus will be on how that's the case in the South Pacific region. But let me just underline the point. Let me try and clarify this point um, about recognising the power of the modern or ideas associated with the modern, but needing to somehow shift beyond them as the default framework. Until we do that, we actually will not get a contemporary reading of this period, I think. We're on our way, that's what this conference uh, is about. Okay, so what we're doing, I think, is trying to reach back over the immediate past, which is the early years of contemporary art, reach back over the transformatory moments of the 1960s and 1970s, which occurred differently in all sorts of places, and in fact that transformatory moment is still occurring now in some places. We're reaching to what tends to be called the multiple modernities, of the early and mid 20th century. Now that's part of the project that I do history within that uh, framework, that's how I do my art history. But there's a recursive concern I have about the recursion to the modern within it. Because it tends to imply, it's not implied here by any of us, but it, it's a default position that I really want to clarify and be clear we're arguing against tends to imply that throughout this whole period, art everywhere on the planet, uh, or sorry, artists everywhere on the planet has always aspired to modernise in some sense. They either succeeded or they tried to do so but failed or they refused to do so and therefore in some sense reactionaries. If you have that approach, you risk overlooking the resonance with our, within our practice and institutional formation of the fact that Ideas concerning modernity, modernization, and modernism were always necessary, but they're always historical constructions. They're always Western fictions. They're what Michel Rolf Triolet calls North Atlantic universals. Okay, they're always that's always a carry uh, to take whatever happens in the North Atlantic as a universal for everybody, or at least the default condition. Now, this is a conceptual deformation which has had huge actual and measurable impacts throughout the world, part of, and we're looking at that uh, partly. But it also, if we focus on it as the default, it serves to obscure the persistence, and now I'm gonna name a list of other kinds of forces and developments that actually occur in all the regions that we're looking at throughout the world as currents with energy force and their own integrities uh, at the same time as any all kinds of modernizations. So traditionalisms of various kinds, neo-traditionalisms, cultural continuities that don't take over the traditional form, appropriations from adjacent cultures or from colonizing cultures, counter-modern tendencies, and above all, indigenous art production, which gets very little mention within the frameworks that we uh, tend to look at uh, here which is not modern, nothing to do with modern, engages with uh, the modern and all these other structures uh, as well. So the general point is that art made during modern times was always more complex and made for different reasons than those prioritised by the high achieving but relatively narrow concentrations that we rightly label modernist. So one real big task is to maybe articulate a bit more clearly what we actually mean by modernist uh, what are the features we're looking at and, um, and not default back into the classic ones as defined in um, the standard histories of Western art. The point is the entire array of these interacting forces need to be taken into account. The relative, relativity is plotted if we're going to develop an art historical approach, which while acknowledging the historical impact and force of the Westernist model will supersede it. That's what I think we'll get to, I hope. So this is a debating point. Let's get more specific. The slides come up and I press that. Okay, this is the region that I've been asked to talk about. It's the disposition of the imperial powers, as they were called, um, in 1939, just at the outbreak of World War II, uh, 
Resonances of colonialism are everywhere. Um, the brown indicates British possessions. There we go. British possessions through here. Uh, French in Indochina. Uh, the new imperialists, or the renewed imperialists, the Japanese have at this point taken over part of, uh, of China, um, although that's, that's the battling. Through this region, these are their protectorates. This is very contested as a zone. The thing that may surprise some people in the room is that the American empire reaches all the way to here. As we've just heard, the Philippines is located right there. So, it's pretty clear the, the, what's at stake uh, in terms of the battle um, for, for this region. In countries such as Australia, um, it's, which a European enclave of enormous size but very small population, our phrase for it is that we are a torn continent, a page torn from the book, book of Europe, which just floated somehow down magically and dropped here in the bottom of Southeast Asia. <laughs> A page torn from Europe. Um, okay, this is a highly threatening situation, and uh, this poster was prepared to to uh, warn people about the coming invasion um, by Japan in 1942. Deemed so upsetting to the people that the Australian government uh, didn't not distributed only in a few cities, uh, not Queensland or Melbourne, Sydney. It was distributed. Wartime experience was registered in all sorts of ways. Advertisement for uh, Pond's powder here. Also during the Second World War, there's a kind of war, what we call a war communism, uh, a communality, a sense of communality that was experienced on a lateral level between uh, people, uh, including um, when American soldiers came on leave to Australia, creating a, uh, a sense of connection with immediate American culture, a work by Weaver Hawkins called Jitterbugs, which picks up uh, via this sort of this post cubist uh, structure that we've seen before in a number of different countries uh, and, and uh, literalizes it, literalizes the dance uh, in effect within the image itself. Official war artists were commissioned as on the model of uh, England, uh, but they were given a free hand to paint what they wished. And uh, Donald Friend, for example, uh, had an eye for more celebratory moments and did not paint any, um, any great battle pictures, uh, an eye for more intimate moments of what it was to be a soldier. By 1945, the war in the Pacific was nearing its end, although it took, as we know, and as we've heard, acts of unprecedented violence to uh, produce that, the, uh, the dropping of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At this point, technically, Japan still owns all of these, uh, or has control of all of these areas in 1945. Uh, by the end of that year, uh, at the end of the war, that's what they surrendered. And the Allies are shown in blue as this gathering uh, around, and they become the winners uh, of the war. Artists were involved in the beginning of the post-war um, period, figuring in paintings such as uh, Repatriated Prisoner of War is processed. This is an idealized version of this uh, gentleman who spent some time in a uh, prison camp uh, to almost no effect. Uh, and this is sort of an image of um, uh, transformation that the processing um, itself, uh, by the army itself, uh, they hoped uh, would produce. Other artists who'd actually been to Europe and brought back some imagery from Europe um, were able to show uh, a different sort of reality uh, as you see here. Moore was an artist who was with a Welsh brigade that liberated uh, Belson. But most, of, most Australian artists of consequence processed the war by absorbing its effects as resonances within what they're already doing. What they were doing was mythologizing Australian experience and that had been, become their main enterprise. This is the Antipodean vision that they were developing already during uh, the war itself. Literally, it's a war effect, not a post-war one, it's a war effect because of the sense of being yet further isolated um, from Europe. A painting called by Arthur Boyd, one of our great artists, called Melbourne Burning. This is um, using Bruegelian imagery as he, as he was doing at the time, uh, mixing that with uh, expressionist imagery. This is a, a painting of something that did not happen to any Australian city. Um, 
except for Darwin. Darwin was the only city that was bombed. The country was not invaded. But this takes us to the first and most important impact of post-war in Australian art, which what it did was deepen the sense of alienation, a sense of being alienation which was actually at the core of what it was to be an Australian, uh, to figure antipathy and vision. The tyranny of distance, the distance from Europe, the, tor the tearing was accelerated. The colonial founder of, um, of Australia, Britain, was unab unable to defend the country uh, during the war when it was threatened by Japanese invasion. So the nation pivoted towards dependence on the United States. On the other hand, the other great fear Australians have is the fear of the interior. And almost all Australian paintings have this distant horizon that head into an unknowable, unaccessible, um, very fearful interior. And this fear was, uh, was increased during the war period on, in the belief that people from Asia were planning to invade Australia, wouldn't understand it was a desert, no one could live there, please don't invade us, leave it to the native people to survive uh, in the desert. So this is a post-war effect, or it turns into a post-war effect because it's the effect of a country whose anxiety was increased, but it was a country that was neither invaded or devastated. And this led to uh, a focus on indirection, irony, a sense of the uncanny fragility of the ordinary. And within that, there's a search for different kinds of heroism um, within the figure, for example, of Arthur Drysdale's The Drover's Wife. Yet another kind is Sidney Nolan's series um, of Ned Kelly. Um, this drew on his experience as a wartime deserter, his family memories of the outlaw, of engaging the outlaw. His, one of his uh, uncles was a constable who hunted Kelly in about 100 years earlier. Kelly was an Irish recidivist, uh, a revolutionary, one of the very few in the history of uh, the Australian colonies, as well as being a straight-out major outlaw. And what um, Nolan was doing was trying to produce a kind of landscape painting that was all horizon, in a sense, that sort of worked against the framing of the Australian Landscape School, which was much more conventional uh, sort of gum tree school, um, and very British in, uh, its, uh, in its character, although also full of French Impressionism. He was working against that and mixing a kind of disappearing of that landscape with a love, a very direct love of early um, European avant-garde art, he once told me, he said, I just wanted to see how the black square would look in the middle of the desert. And the whole series turns on that. And that, in fact, is modernist. It's modernist in intention and its outcome. And very little else, I think, in Australian art can be described that precisely as modernist um, uh, at the time. So for many Australian artists, the end of the war meant the chain, a chance to visit Europe uh, had returned. Albert Tucker, who, like Nolan, was one of the Angry Penguin group of expressionist surrealist artists based in Melbourne for the duration of the war, made the unusual decision to travel via Japan uh, and an even more unusual decision to go to Hiroshima and record that in uh, paintings, a whole series of watercolours that he did. He did not pers pursue that uh, in the rest of his work, however, so it's a kind of exception, exceptional moment. But it does lead us to the second major impact of post-war in the region, which we've heard a little bit about, so I'll work uh, quickly through that. That's the fact that this entire region became a theatre for the testing of atomic weapons, that, which is the deep arsenal of the Cold War. It's the machinery of mutually assured destruction, as they called it, that underscored the atomic age. This is yet another view of the um, uh, Bikini Atoll um, bomb that you saw images uh, of before. And the resonances of that were picked up by certain artists. Again, Weaver Hawkins, uh, uh, an Englishman, grew up in uh, England but worked in Australia during this period, um, who's trying to think quite directly the impacts uh, that he's seeing of reporting on the bomb and the recognition of somehow the the force and the power of uh, atomic power as a scientific um, 
possibility, a sort of uh, a neutralised way of thinking about it. But for him, that's a step too far because he's clearly suggesting already not that this power is not just very powerful, but it will produce um, uh, broken figures, uh, strange humans, odd humans, different from uh, these figures, this family of man, if you like, who's really just had it. So it's a point about the, uh, the future being filled with this stuff um, that, um, that I made before, um, and, and not by anything particularly positive, even though, of course, the positive approach under the heading of developmentalism, like we've heard in other papers, became the official uh, ideology that uh, countries like Australia became committed to um, during this period. Um, we've seen already from Reiko showed briefly this work, uh, and I mentioned this work actually toured around the world. I saw it as a schoolboy. I can still remember the nightmares that evening. Oh no, five minutes. <laughs> I can still remember the nightmares of that, of seeing that work. Okay, we're going to do a quick buzz through New Zealand art, which is uh, very important during this region. New Zealand artists, um, similar work um, by the war artists, uh, Colin McCann, very parallel to Sidney Nolan, um, in taking, uh, suddenly seeing his own world as profoundly alienated, profoundly emptied, um, and subject to, in this case, a modernist read, uh, traveling through, looking uh, out of a car, seeing it as an evacuated landscape. A further point uh, that connects with many of the papers that we've just seen it was brought up by two young art historians, Rex Butler and A.D. Donaldson, who uh, is actually an artist who paints like this now. Um, their insight is that a kind of quasi-utopianism, or better, a transcendental, optimistically universalizing kind of dream, the dream of the early 20th century abstract painters, some of whom we heard about from Boris yesterday, Kandinsky, Mondrian, Malevich, this dream actually survived the horrors of the war, the horrors of the whole mid 20th century, at least in the hearts of a number of abstract painters living around the Pacific Rim. And it reappeared as an aspiration for art during the, during the 50s. And here you see artists who actually have very long backgrounds in the 30s studying in Paris. All of these artists do. Uh, Grace Crowley, stayed and worked in Sydney through, should be in her 80s uh, by the time of painting this picture. Frank Hinder, um, uh, about 30, 40 year, years younger, studied in the United States. John McLaughlin um, studied in Paris, but then returned to the West Coast to produce his kind of work before going on just a few years later to the very spare works that, we, uh, that he's um, famed for, the hard edge work that he's famed for subsequently. So there's a kind of shared, um, there's a continual refinement of the possibility and the dream of abstract transcendence through this kind of painting, um, uh, shared by artists working on parallel tracks who, that come from the same, um, same source, although they may not know each other. The Bandung Conference has been mentioned. Let's just give it a sort of graphic shape. Uh, I won't repeat the main themes of it. We know. So it happened that at the very same time in the Brooklyn Museum, Indonesian art was being shown. Uh, but of course only in the primitive art um, section that so takes us back and forward from where we are. The range of work from Indonesia um, has already been discussed, so I'll, I'll go from um, change from work that was individual expressionist here to uh, a recollection work um, that goes back to the Lekri years um, by um, Joko Pekic. Again, we've heard about that from um, Amanda. It's interesting to me that Jim um, Suppengat, who uh, has written about these things, speaks about a multi-modernism in Indonesia, arguing that um, it's a specific mix that's quite concrete for Indonesia, modernism seen through pluralistic principles. And I didn't understand until I heard Amanda's painter, uh, paper that he's really trying to speak about a time beyond the divisions that she, um, that she spoke about uh, so clearly. So a couple more works to uh, wrap this up. Work by Maori artists. Um, I have to represent just by the collective input into this marae um, and draw your attention to the kuru designs on the roof here. 
that were picked up by one of the leading Pakeha or white artists, Gordon Walters, in the series of paintings he began in 1956. So this kind of actual beginnings of this deep interaction, the level of form, the level of the most fundamental shapes that account for both indigenous and non-indigenous artists um, are crucial to the last big effect, the fourth and most final post-war development. Uh, that I'll underline and then I'll conclude in two minutes, okay? <laughs> peoples, the, pushed by indigenous peoples for recognition and for a degree of freedom. Mostly this post-colonial struggle will occur and burst out and, and succeed, begin to succeed in the later 60s and subsequent decades. The visual arts will be a key part of the armory, but some beginnings to be, can be found in our period. I'll show you just a couple of works by Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal artists to begin this out, uh, to set this out. The first is known as the Aboriginal Bark Petition, painted in 1963 by elders um, from the region around Jukala, protesting against a bauxite mine. Uh, they made a proper petition, all typed out here, and they painted their ancestral um, figures, hoping that if they showed this, these figures to the politicians in Canberra, they would understand and ban the mine and give them back their land. Mm -mm, didn't work. Land rights had a long way to go. But one of the signatories of the petition was Mawala Marika, an elder from the uh, Ririn Anju clan from Yakala in northeast Arnhem Land. And part of his responsibilities was to travel from his remote community to the major cities. His painting 1960, in 1963 called Sydney from the Air is a very large bark. Um, you see the dimensions there. It's, um, it does suggest the outlines of Sydney Harbour on the right, but it's mainly about the brown and mustard orange shapes here, the lines between them and his traditional rock or hatching uh, that's specific to his family, his clan design that makes it a sacred design uh, in the centre. This painting was collected by Carol Kupka, son of Franoshek Kupka, the great Czech modernist, and spent some years in the Musée de Colonie at the Palais de Port Doré in Paris. Kupka's enthusiasm for this art was accompanied by his seeing it as an encounter with another age in his book, The Dawn of Art. But this Sydney from the air is not a static image. He's seeing it just as if it's a static image, Sydney from the air. It's not a landscape seen literally from above uh, in some sense. It's not like an earlier form of appropriation, uh, rever uh, reverse, well, this is a direct appropriation west, uh, from Western art, um, from Aboriginal uh, bark painting by Margaret Preston that we see here. Marika was an elder who had uh, major access to law. This is a painting I can't detail, but this is about Barama, the one of the original beings, his two sisters giving birth to the moieties, the different moieties that constitute the world, and in this place, a version of the same birth showing their birth mats covering up um, the birth they've just uh, given to. It, um, it takes a long while to elaborate. But the key point I'm making by showing you that work, which is the kind of work that he made in response to missionaries showing him books about the Christian story um, and him painting uh, the story that he'd inherited. The key point is that these are people capable of showing a much more layered view of the world than what we get when we look at a map like this that was in schools in the 1950s. No one owns anyone, any, put any color you like anywhere. It's all fine. This is a post-war world, very nice post-war world. But the final point I'll make is this, the contrast. When we um, look at a painting like this that embeds a Bullander or a white person's way of moving across country and thinking about landscapes, thinking about maps, embeds it within, in fact, a groundwork of movement from place to place, from sacred stopping place that's not shown to another one across this entire space really between Yakala, which is no, in no specific place, to a white place that has to be in a specific place. When we see Marika um, embedding uh, non-indigenous ways of being inside his own, 
Then we get a kind of ground plan, I think, for coevality. This not only pictures the contemporaneity of difference that's operating for him at this time, but it shows us how they could possibly uh, come together in some way. So to me, this is a world, this is the kind of world picture I'm finishing for post, unless we can do this, post-coloniality doesn't succeed. This way we can become kind of truly post-war if this can be achieved. And it's the same kind of world picture that we need to have if we're ever going to become contemporary nowadays. So thanks. Um, before you all spend more time scratching your heads about why a paper called Decentering Paris is on an Asia panel, I thought I might say a few words um, about how here I'm actually taking Asia as a scholarly perspective rather than as an object, rather than purely as an object of study. And I hope that as I speak, we'll, you will be able to see a little bit more uh, of why I've chosen to do this and the kind of theoretical intervention that I'm trying to make here. Hopefully that will also be in dialogue with what Terry had to say at the beginning of his paper. Our current models of multiple modernisms have just begun to account for modernism's transnational complexity, creating an accumulation of previously invisible narratives about art of the 20th century beyond Paris and New York, the richness of which is amply apparent in this conference. To the frustration of many of us, however, Paris and New York continue to exert a gravitational pull on even self-consciously decentered narratives. This paper argues that in order to truly rethink the post-war from a global perspective, world art histories cannot just focus their energies on historically defined per peripheries, but must also interrogate modernism's putative centers, demonstrating their fundamentally transcultural and multivalent character beyond what in my book I call tr cultural mercantilism. And I'm not gonna get into that here today. That is to say that it is imperative to re-examine the multiple facets of cultural encounter preceded, produced through imperialism, colonialism, migration, travel, commerce, and media beyond the unidirectional lens of domination that reduces these stories to European inspiration, such as Japonisme, primitivism, orientalism, and the dissemination of modernism's innovations to the periphery. So basically, you know, in, in that argument I ask, why is it that we consider Van Gogh inspired by Japan, whereas Kuro Daiseiki is a, der der a derivative artist? Lost in the battle between Paris and New York for the title of capital of the 20th century were the legions of artists from around the world who settled in these two cities enriching the cultural landscape and producing their own work, only to be marginalized by national art histories on both sides of the Atlantic. In post-Vichy Paris, nationalist narratives were reinforced during a time of social, cultural, and political anxiety. And, as Hannah Feldman points out, for France, this was not a time of merely post-war, but during war as France fought to cling to a disintegrating empire while waging an ideological war back home in an effort to cir circumscribe and disseminate la culture française. These tensions led to the historical obfuscation of the city's role as an international incubator, either naturalizing or marginalizing the foreign-born. To take us an example from French intellectual history, let us take a moment to reflect upon the fact that Jacques Derrida, Hélène Sixou, and Jacques Rancière were all born in Algeria. That Jean-François Lyontard taught in Algeria, uh, sorry, in Algeria, and Michel Foucault in Tunisia. How would it force us to reconsider French theory if we were to acknowledge its global creolization as well as its larger geopolitical context? Similarly, any assessment of the world's modernisms and its founding figures in Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and the Americas soon reveals a common trajectory 
of study and expatriation in Paris. The list of artists who spent time in the city is long and diverse and international. Chinese-born Xu Bei Hong, Lebanese-born Salua Raudia Shuker, Brazilian-born Ligia Clark, Japanese-born Kudo Tetsumi, Korean-born Liu Fan, South African-born Gerard Sokoto, Argentine-born Julio Le Parc, South African-born Ernest Mancoba, and Uruguayan-born Joaquim Torres Garcia, to name but a few. As we begin to write the histories of these artists from far and wide, their stories are, for the most part, inscribed into the national histories of their countries of origin. This is the case even in the ambitious Modernité Plurielle at the Centre Pompidou. In most of our histories of these figures, the historical memories of their Parisian lines of flight are preserved as testament to their status and engagement with the international art world in chronologies illustrated with photographs that demonstrate their contact with art world luminaries, but tell us little about their quotidian experiences and encounters in Paris beyond the obvious bilateral engagements. Re-territorialized into the art histories of their countries of origin, these expatriate trajectories create a map that can be and has been perceived as modernism's dissemination to the periphery. In this mapping, Paris appears as the origins of the world's modernism, echoing the disparaging tone of critic André Warnaud's coinage of the 19, in 1925 of the term École de Paris to describe the foreign artists who flocked to Montparnasse. I thus envisioned rethinking Paris, not as modernism's point of origin, or as an academy for world modernisms, but as a site that, through path dependence, began to draw in artists from around the world who traveled to partake in its cosmopolitan artistic culture. Their very presence in Paris, I argue, globalized its landscape, created transnational alliances, and contributed to the explosive and paradigm-shifting culture of post-war modernism as it developed in Paris. If we use economics and urban studies from the, to frame the issues in terms less fraught by issues of cultural identity, the argument becomes much clearer. In what is known as the Porter hypothesis, economist Michael Porter argues that clusters of innovation, in particular industries, are formed as a result of path dependency or reliance upon already established pool, talent pools, infrastructures, and sites of knowledge dissemination. Attracting talent from around the world, sites such as Silicon Valley benefit from a cross-fertilization of ideas that sustain the vitality of the cluster and thus attract more migrants, creating a virtuous circle. Further embedded into what Jane Jacobs theorized and Richard Florida coined the creative city, these communities thrive and grow in interdisciplinary and international networks. In the remainder of this paper, I will be sketching out two examples of Paris as a porter cluster from opposite ends of the political and aesthetic spectrum. First, I will consider the transnational space of uh, encounter enabled by Michel Tapier's Un Art Autre and its post-war search for aesthetic universalism through international abstraction, precisely what you were speaking about just now, Terry. Second, I will examine the transnational anti-colonial sympathies enabled by Algerian-born critic Gérard gassiot talabo through the Figuration Narrative group. For art critic Michel Tapier, the end of the Second World War required a rethinking of expression, an acknowledgement of the fact that humanism, as it was understood in Europe, had failed. Building upon Adorno's notion of architecture after Auschwitz, Paul Celan's material experimentation with language, and Jean Fautrier's articulation as flesh through matière, Tapier sought to, to define an other art, un art autre. In addition to its obvious existential resonances, the other that Tapier sought was an other of European classicism, be it African-American jazz, Chinese philosophy, Japanese ink painting, data, or mathematics. Although Tapier's exoticism is unmistakable 
what distinguishes his position from that of earlier generations was its almost utopian form of post-war internationalism, this never-again worldview that fueled the formation of organizations from the United Nations to Documenta, sought to redress the wrongs of the Second World War by creating international sites of encounter. In Tapie's case, he both established bases of power in Paris and New York, where he showed works by international artists, and also nurtured more per peripheral sites, such as Turin, Osaka, and Tokyo. It is to Tapie's credit that he sought direct encounters with contemporary artists working in Japan, a place that he perceived as the origins of an other, more philosophically rigorous practice of abstraction. In 1956, he received a few copies of the Gutai Journal from Paris-based informel artist Domoto Hisao and took his first trip to Japan the following year. Tapie found a kindred spirit there in Yoshihara Jiro, who similarly believed in post-war internationalism as an ethical project. Yoshihara, located in Osaka, sought to define an international common ground, where the, quote, arts of the East and West influence each other, and that, he claimed, was the natural course of the history of art. And this was in 1958 that he said this. In 1958, the two leaders staged the international art of a new era, a wildly ambitious exhibition that brought together informel, abstract expressionism, and gutai. This collaborative exhibition that toured Japan and was excerpted for New York articulated the contours of a deep commitment to internationalism for both Yoshihara and Tapie. Despite Yoshihara's repeated assertions that Gutai does not practice Orientalism, however, Tapie continued to perceive Gutai as a kind of contemporary take on Zen calligraphy, ink painting. The two leaders spent years negotiating the reception of Gutai, leaving a historical record of both readings that made a great impression on the artists of Tapie's circle. Back in Paris, Gutai became a visible part of Tapie's universe, showing alongside Tapie's other artists in, a, in transnational exhibitions such as Métamorphisme and Structure de Répétition before having their own Gutai exhibition in 1965. As a result, many of the artists alongside whom Gutai showed eventually traveled to Japan, initiating new dialogues and opening the interpretation of Gutai beyond Tapie's purview. Most of these artists themselves were emigres to Paris, such as American-born Sam Francis and Paul Jenkins, Argentine-born Lucio Fontana, Italian-born Franco Assetto and Franco Gavelli, South African-born Christo Kutzi. To take but one artistic line of flight, as an example, in 1959, Kutzi traveled to Japan through the intercession of Tapie. His year-long stay left a searing impression that he brought back to South Africa, along with boxes of Gutai slides and 11 Gutai paintings, which are now in the collection of the University of Johannesburg. Recontextualized in South Africa that by the mid-1970s was becoming volatile, Gutai's radical gesture took on new meaning. During his protest phase, Kutzi le lectured repeatedly about Gutai and in 1975 slashed his own paintings to ribbons at an opening at the South African Association of Arts in Cape Town. Reflecting on the decision to cut his paintings, he revealed, I remembered a visit to a Japanese absurd theater, theater event it was when I studied there in 1959 to 1960. On the stage were four carton boxes covered in brown paper. At one stage, the well-known Shimamoto stormed onto stage and lashed the boxes to pieces with sticks. The idea was that the square boxes were transformed and that the ripped pieces were integral to it. Suddenly, I knew I should do the same with my work. Although Tapie had initially imagined his Art Autre project as a series of bilateral relationships with himself as a center of a universal language of abstraction, the multilateral relationships that he enabled were far more fruitful than he could possibly have imagined and deserved for further study. As opposed to Tapie's Art Autre, 
My second case study in this remapping of Paris as transnational site of encounter was self-consciously political. The Figuration Narrative group engaged in what, was called, what they called the art of contestation and coalesced in 1964 after an exhibition entitled Mythologie Quotidienne at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris organized by Algerian-born critic Gérard Gassio Talabo. Aligning itself with Roland Barthes' mythologies, this exhibition trumpeted the new group's critically engaged stance. In particular, it privileged the group's denunciation of 1960s consumer culture and mass media, thus positioning it against the celebratory discourses of American pop and nouveau réalisme. Held only a few months after Robert Rauschenberg's triumph in Venice, Mythologie Quotidienne articulated a clearly oppositional stance that grew increasingly more politically engaged over the next few years. As such, the Figuration Narrative group attracted the attention of the intellectuals who would emerge out of the student protests of 1968, including Pierre Bourdieu, Gilles Deleuze, Jacques Derrida, and Jean-François Lyotard. Already in 1964, this group of artists was extremely international comprising artists from Argentina, Brazil, Germany, Haiti, Iceland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, Switzerland, the United States, as well as France. Their primary targets in these early years were the society of the spectacle, as well as the history of art and of the art system itself, which they saw as validating the history of art and the arts, sorry, um, which they saw as validating and propagating artistic activity that was insufficiently engaged with critical discourse. On the left, Peter Klassen denigrates post champion pop as a reification of commodity culture taken to its extreme. On the right, referencing the myth of Danae with a faceless odalisque imprisoned by a bourgeois interior, Henry Cueco reproaches what he saw as a reduction of the role of the artist to decorator. For Haitian-born Hervé Telemac, however, politics necessarily meant global politics. In his 1960 painting, Toussaint L'Ouverture in New York, he invoked the figure of Haiti's liberator, a freed slave who galvanized slaves across the colony to defeat their French masters. Placing Toussaint Louverture in New York with a mask-like form in the top left side of the painting, next to an arrow seemingly pointing north to Harlem, Télémaque was making clear reference to the American civil rights movement as a decolonial movement. Painting in, painted in 1960, the resonance with France's own decolonial war in Algeria would have been inevitable. In 1964, he adopted the comic strip aesthetic advocated by some members of Figuration Narrative as a resistance against bourgeois aesthetics and injected into it his own brand of global political critique. Here, the vocabulary of Bugs Bunny and Esso take on a new significance when rendered in colors that are slightly off in the context of Haiti's 1963 detente with the United States as a bulwark against communist Cuba. Global politics also figured in the work of Argentine-born Antonio Berni. As Mari Carmen Ramirez argues, his work transforms the condemnation of consumer culture to a new level of third world critique through its narrations of Juanito, a boy from the shanty town, and Ramona, a prostitute who by the end of the 1960s stood in for the sheer weight of human tribulations, and this is a quote, sorry, the ravages of exploitation, the urgent need of revolutionary change that is infinitely more evident in South America than in Europe or in the United States. By the early 1970s, he takes this critique in an even more radical aesthetic and political direction with an installation of monsters made of found objects in his solo exhibition, The Massacre of the Innocents. Arguably, the group functioned as a fertile site for non-Western solidarity, as the group's political discourses ultimately moved towards global issues, the civil rights movement, reflections on Algeria, the Vietnam War. 
And with the addition of Japanese-born Kudo Tetsumi, the global significance of Hiroshima. Icelandic-born Eros bland American interiors taken from furniture catalogs populated by figures that seemingly stepped out of Vietnamese wartime posters underscores the fiction of American post-war peace and prosperity. By featuring a Vietnamese woman and child as its primary protagonists, it also underscores the unfairness of the match. And if, in case you're wondering, it says, um, Vietnam must win, America must lose, underneath, in Chinese. Taken out of Japan and performed in Europe, Kudo's philosophy of impotence assumed a significance beyond the disappointments of the 1960s um, anti-AMPO anti demonstrations in Tokyo that pr protested the renewal of the U.S.-Japan Mutual Security Treaty. In a letter that Kudo published in 1967, he wrote, Hiroshima was a tragedy, but I cannot think that the act committed at Hiroshima was an act of cruelty par excellence. There were many others perpetrated by the Japanese, the Americans, the Germans, the Russians, and many others. Hiroshima represents but one of those acts. But at Hiroshima, the glow of the atomic bomb, the white shadows who were human beings, evaporated and were fixed in a fraction of a second. I see that in these shadows, a transcendent comment on the tragedy of war. So this is um, what Kudo wrote in 1967. By bringing together diverse acts of confrontation by artists from around the world, Gassio Talabo provoked the artists of Figuration Narrative to think in more philosophical terms about the politics of contestation, which art historian Sarah Wilson argues provided the visual context for the rise of French theory. What would happen, I ask, if we were to consider the importance of Paris as a transnational site for both Figuration narrative and French theory. In the context of the Cold War, Figuration narrative was received as being too close to socialist realism and was rejected by the press. Perhaps more importantly, the group was also caught between the national struggles between American pop and French nouveau realisme. Dismissed by the outspoken nouveau realiste leader Pierre Restani as a mediocrity international, <laughs> he has a way with words. Um, Figuration narrative lost credibility on the French scene by the end of the 1960s, and their story of transnational solidarity was lost. Across the political spectrum, Paris functioned as a site of encounter for artists from around the world. As, as this project to decenter Paris progresses from the very early stages of my investigation now, I continue to seek out new sites of transnational engagement for further research, be they schools, studios, galleries, museums, exhibitions, movements, critics, magazines, cafes, restaurants, you name it. This is necessarily a bottom-up enterprise and a history that relies upon the kind collaboration of many. And I thus end this paper with an appeal to all of you for your assistance. Thank you. I think it was wonderfully um, done that all these threads were put together from the various cultures and to show all this cooperation and meeting up and interconnections of these cultures. But the question rises, how can we handle uh, concepts like internationalism and globalism when half the world was excluded of it and in many cases all those individual artists who <clears throat> participated in that global international world were exceptions in their own cultures. Um, do I go? Okay. Artists are always exceptions in their culture, every artist. Um, no, uh, it's true. I mean, why else would you be an artist uh, in all, virtually every, in every culture? Um, so not in a sense, I mean, in one way that's, that's an obvious thing to say, it's also a westernist thing to say, but I'm saying it quite deliberately because um, the artists who become, say, profound 
um, Thai mural painters, the great long tradition of mural painting in Thailand, um, is in the end only done by a few people who are exceptional amongst all those who apprenticed to become um, traditionalists uh, or neo-traditionalists. So, um, so I don't. I think a lot of the problems that we have are precisely because we want to apply generalizations like I just did without differentiating them like I just did and making them specific. And particularly um, terms like international or global um, or modern. I think modern has become a term that's got, it's, it's got that character. It's got that character of subsisting below the, um, in a sense, below the, t the more the actual general terms that we need, um, that are, are general terms like contemporaneity, but also like uh, the coeve, coevality, exchange, encounter. We need terms on that level, and we definitely need lots of specific terms to, you know, discuss what we're talking about. Um, I think we tend to go get into a lot of trouble um, at, the, at the sort of nearly top level of terms. Um, so that a term like international becomes used as a value uh, in itself, a term like modern becomes used, what, whatever. And, but in every case, it only occurs because it's usually there's some kind of um, uh, discussion or debate or differentiation that has to be made at a local level. So in Australia, for example, I'm regarded as an internationalist, not just because I spend half my time abroad, but because every time anyone in the Australian art world becomes a kind of super nationalist for one reason or another, I will attack them. I will say, that's closing down the space. Um, and um, so, you know, so the things are, it's, it's complicated. There's not a simple answer to your question. But, but if we can actually see a, a way of, um, of understanding the different conceptual level on which terms work usually, and if we can see how that plays itself out in any given art culture um, and in the discourses within that art culture, um, then we can be specific, you know, like what we've heard. We've actually heard papers that, throughout the last two days that have tried to specify what the more general, a little less general, central and more specific relationships and terms are, how they operate. So that's how I'd answer that. Um, thanks for that, Terry. Um, I, I agree with you, but I also, in that I, I do feel that artists are exceptional, but I also don't feel that art artists are that exceptional in the sense that... <laughs> In the sense, sometimes that, they're really well, sometimes they're really <laughs> exceptional. But um, no, just in, the ter in terms of um, internationalism and just trying to understand what do we mean when we say talk about internationalism? Um, is it's not just black and white, and it's also not um, you know a question of you know just being able to travel to one place. But you know, if you think obviously of apagerized scapes, that it helps us to conceptualize the various levels at which um, the different uh, different nations are interconnected through finance finance, culture, immigration, as well as travel and ideology, for example. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that it's a mistake to just say that, well, these people are elites who can travel um, and therefore they're exceptional and disconnected from whatever is happening in, you know, their countries of origin, but that we should also imagine that, you know, the, um, the people who went to the church, um, the chapel of, holy, of the holy sacrifice, who, I've been there, I actually went to a Christmas mass there. <laughs> yeah. um, that, you know, they're very ordinary people um, who, uh, who are exposed to the sort of internationalist architecture at Osorio's um, murals. Um, many, of, and this is, uh, points to another kind of internationalism, many of the people who go to these masses, um, especially the Christmas mass, um, are are returnees from abroad who are working as domestic workers in different parts of the world. So there are different levels of internationalism. You don't necessarily have to be an elite. Thank you. I feel a, bit, a little bit misunderstood. So the heavier part of my question was how do we define globalism and internationalism when half the world is excluded of it? I mean, during the Cold War, 
uh, everything that you now put together, which is relevant, which is absolutely good. I mean, you know, that's not a problem. But the world, this of this international and global world excluded Russia, China in Eastern Europe, right? But they were speaking to each other. There was a transnationalism within didn't. Russia, China, <laughs> and you know, and that people were. Well, I mean, they weren't traveling at quite the same um, <laughs> rates as as people um, in the sort of commun uh, in the capitalist bloc. But I mean, one thing that I've learned from just being here over the past you know, day is that there were communications. That you know, it, there was the 1952 socialist realist Russian exhibition in India, right? Um, it's it's not insignificant, I don't think. But but the point was made, uh, Ming, that by Boris yesterday that um, people in Soviet countries during this period, for most of this period, um, were internationalists in their aspirations and dreams right. about the world. Mm -hmm but uh, were unable to actually move from the country unless they had an official role. And this is the background, Eva Forkash is uh, also in, from Hungary and Yugoslavia, right through that region. And so clearly a lot of the enterprise throughout history in, in ex-Central um, and ex-Eastern Europe or East of Europe um, has been a, an exercise of recovery of um, what would have been parallel and shared traditions mm. and, and that's been I think a really quite rich thing to uh, to to reach back to uh, earlier kinds of art and to create a kind of um, what tends to be called a post-war avant-garde so a, a, invent an avant-garde that didn't exist in the periods um, where it might have existed mm -hmm. had there been mm -hmm. continuity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean that's that structure that operates there I mean I'd like to know more. I obviously don't know that much about um, the communist bloc during this yeah. period, but I mean, wasn't there a circulation of journals, of um, yeah, it's, exhibitions? It's very small it's scale. It's very different, to the rest. obviously. Anyway, yeah. Thank you for all the uh, presentations. I found them quite provocative. But I wanted to direct the question at Patrick Flores in terms of the Chapel of the Holy Sacrifice. Um, and it has to do with the establishment of the University of the Philippines, which was founded by the Americans as a secular institution. It's interesting because most of the major universities in the Philippines are where are Catholic. And so it's interesting to me that the chapel is seen as this intersection of modernity, the church and state, in some ways is actually a throwback to the colonial era of uh, Spanish Catholicism. And wasn't the chapel also a focus of uh, battles, intellectual battles on campus between, say, communism, the student activists, as well as Delaney, who was a very conservative Irish Jesuit? I was wondering if you could expand on that a bit. Yeah, I think I mentioned that in the paper that uh, while the, uh, in the midst of the construction of the uh, chapel, Delaney was embroiled in these uh, debates about uh, secularization in, in the campus and the role of religious life in the, in, in, in the university. So there was this uh, like quite uh, acrimonious uh, an intense conflict between Delaney and uh, the activists. So I think this, uh, I think, is part of the uh, discussion on the production of, of of modernity in in that in that situation. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but uh, it was also Delaney who uh, commissioned the architect to to produce the uh, the building. So uh, on the one hand, he, he was very conservative, but I think aesthetically he was quite progressive in, in a sense. So it's difficult to reduce uh, Delaney as a conservative figure uh, fighting against the activists, uh, I think. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, papers, I heard. Um, I'm a little bit wondering about art history now, about its methods and vocabulary. Because I'm thinking uh, your methods are not so uh, far away from modernism, speaking about styles, 
about uh, avant-garde, about folklore and indigenous art. What do you think about methods uh, we need to look for, more forward, um, speaking about images, fetishes, I don't know, uh, pictures, which are framing our art historical methods? Aren't we, don't, don't we need another sort of vocabulary? Or don't we need another sort of looking at art history or art historians speaking from other areas of the world? Because we spoke, we, I heard about Australian art, but I didn't hear something about uh, people arguing about their art there. So I think they, we have a difficulty. It's, it's not resolved, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. What do you... Uh, could you propose to these problems we are dealing with now? Yeah, I think Terry, you were <laughs> trying to expand. Yeah, <laughs> but you were earlier trying to expand the vocabulary of uh, yeah. of methodologies, and I'd like to add three more to that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the question of the lady was about was I think premised on exclusion. Like the, like the rest of the world, or half of the uh, the first first question uh, mm. was was excluded. So I was struck by the uh, centrality of exclusion, mm. uh, something that would overdetermine the the international. So in response to uh, exclusion, I'd like to offer three terms, and I think these three terms were also uh, in a way. Uh, Mm, fleshed out by the paper that I presented. One is equivalence, not really equality, I think, but a certain like a translation or an equivalent gesture of, of the local in conversation with what is perceived as the non-local, which could be maybe the national, the regional, the global, or the transnational. The, the second one would be entitlement. I think instead of, uh, sometimes we belabor critique, but I think Luxin, the architect, was entitled to the modern and to the foreign. So he, uh, entitlement or enlightenment? Entitlement. He entitlement. was entitlement to, to the Western. He was entitled to the oh, foreign. So, yeah. uh, so he didn't have to get out of, of Manila to study international architecture. And he produced an equivalent form in the Philippines. And finally, eccentricity. I think the Osorio figure <coughs> is an eccentric figure uh, coming back to the Philippines and uh, producing that uh, fantastic uh, altar painting. So I think in, I, in response to exclusion, I offer equivalence, I offer entitlement, and I offer eccentricity. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, just uh, was a comment here yeah, about exclusion. Because speaking about exclusion, uh, we have to ask ourselves who has excluded uh, whom, yeah? yeah? And looking at the Soviet countries, I would say modernism was excluded and the Western was excluded, yeah? I mean, um, uh, the Western uh, art history and art business even, yeah, never excluded the East, actually. Um, Soviet Union and China excluded the West and despised the West, yeah, and the, the Western modernism. Modernism in the Soviet Union, China, and other countries, Soviet bloc, uh, was um, not regarded as a, a, a hegemonistic or a hegemonial, uh, but as something actually decadent, laughable, and um, something that, that is temporary, yeah, that will disappear maybe a couple of years yeah, mm. uh, together <laughs> with right. all this you know, Western decadence. So, um, uh, it is one example, yeah, but uh, we can find other examples of uh, modernist tendencies in different countries, uh, also in this period and in recent period, being suppressed and excluded by traditionalist regimes, also, re uh, also on religious uh, grounds and so on and so on. So I, w I wouldn't, uh, looking around the world, uh, I would say uh, modernism is a battle cry. Yes, yeah. Battle cry. Battle. It is a slogan. Yeah. It's not something that you can establish, but it's something that you fight against or do you fight for. Uh, 
in a different, in a difficult situation of uh, cultural conflict, cultural conflict between different forces inside your own society. Some of them define themselves as traditionalist and anti-modernist, some of them as pro-Western, some of them are anti-Western, so on and so on. And uh, now, after the end of the Soviet Union, uh, it's also the end of modernism, I would say. Yeah, in this kind of, uh, in this kind of, uh, in its active attitude, its position uh, on the ideological fire. So what we have today is postmodernism, postcommunism, post this, post that. Mm. Uh, we have the situation after the battle. Yeah. So for me, modernist is a party in a battle. It is indeed an army, yeah, as you said. It is an army, it is a fighting squad. Yeah? When a uh, fight is over, modernism is also over, together with its enemies. Okay. Can I quickly go back and answer your question before, if I can? I'll come back. To, okay. So, <coughs> I think some of the terms um, that are being developed in a sort of deeper um, language um, have come out and in a way you can see them in the effort to analyse works. When, when we have time to look at works in a little more detail than just show you one quick example like if Ka did, could look at certain works in uh, one or two works in some detail. Um, what I think he's identifying is, um, is, a, is a, actually a, a different conception um, or an emerging conception of what it is to figure form, in other words, to give form figure, to let different kinds of figures come through when you have um, a, a kind of conjunction of, um, if you like, inherited pictorial structures, visual structures from different cultures that you want to be responsible to, okay, that's much, is more of a mix than the ones that are operating if you're operating in terms of the conventional artistic narrative within your style area. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about it. On the other hand, if you go to what Ming laid out for us, um, uh, she actually laid out an internal diversity within a narrative that's usually told in a much more direct and standard style history way where you go through the new realists and get everybody else, you know. So um, it's got these multiple dimensions, but it has to operate, for me it still has to operate as giving a better account of the actual artwork than is being given by people who are not paying attention to the, all these other factors that are operative um, in, the, uh, in the case. The further thing that's also come out, I think, on our panel, a couple more, we, uh, as we, as we do this multiple modernities revision uh, of all these histories, it's not just a matter of adding more works. It's a, it's a matter of paying attention to um, a period before secularism totally dominated. Um, it is a matter of paying attention to, uh, you know, a spiritual force and power of, of um, which is implicit in a lot of what you were saying, and if it cars work and uh, various artists, Australian indigenous artists, that it's a question of imminence, right? The imminence of, of the form and the work becomes imminent in a different way uh, than it does if the enterprise is a secular one, totally secular one. And it varies, if there's a dialogue between the two of them, there's a different operation of imminence that's, that's occurring, uh, I think. So just on the technical level of trying to answer, that's how I'd start to, does that make sense? Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, okay, all right. Um, Boris is right about modernism, that battle's over, but it keeps resonating in all the terms that we use. Um, and it keeps sort of filling up, as I keep saying. It's become a kind of contemporary battle, re-modernism. Um, yeah. so. I actually have a, a couple of things to say there yeah, as well. Um, just to, to respond to your question again. Um, I, I think that what you're, you're sort of teasing out there, Terry, is something very important, that what 
um, engaging with these different contexts means is that we have to also not just think about the objects from uh, the perspective of Western theoretical models, but that we also have to pay attention to the intellectual histories of the countries um, that these works come from. And I don't think that we would have to pay attention to those intellectual histories to, at the exclusion of um, the sort of theoretical frameworks of Western modernism, because those artists are also reading you know, the same um, the authors that um, people situated in Europe are. Um, but that there is this kind of hybridity, there is a kind of usage of different kinds of thinking that needs to be um, brought to bear on these objects. And, and so I, I don't know if that um, addresses Mm. Right. And, but sorry, the one other one, uh, Patrick. I don't know whether you want to speak to this or not. But the the kind of um, um, there's a discourse, there's a visual discourse of a certain sexualities involved here, um, and um, um, like a, a, a Tony, like ten years ago, people started to speak about the major gay sexuality in New York painting, you know, Rauschenberg and Johns and Cage and the whole, whole sort of enterprise of of that history just not being written, or you know, that the again, it's a, it's a there's a searching in a lot of the work we looked at, and I think in, in some of the work you showed, to to establish a kind of um, um, it's put in terms of the universalist, a common grounded bond between people, and so on and so forth, and that's that's what it is. That's a desirable state to get to. But it's also a sense of, you know, give a space for our sexuality, you know. I mean, there's a sense uh, and our sexuality has a certain aesthetic which is finding its form um, in this design or that design and so on. Very rarely spoken about, but really crucial during this whole period. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So stop lecturing, yeah, okay. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, the, uh, I have a question to Lin Lin. Uh, maybe that was your off, uh, off the cuff comment or remark, but I thought that's actually very important for all of us, which is you said you thought China is very different and then like uh, being here you feel more about it. And then on the one hand, I do actually agree looking at China's modern, China, modern history and then you know, recent histories, to like a Korea or Japan, yes, it's different. However, that's a, you know, like a, we heard the word exclusion just before, and it's actually kind of exclusionary comment. I want, uh, because they are like a, a secret, I want to confess. Long time, I put Matsuzawa as different category. He is very different, I think but you know, nobody bite him. You know, nobody got interested in him. And then like, I was wondering, and then recently I realized, because I made him so different, that it's almost impossible to take him. And then like, you know, okay, so like, is there anything we can put him resonating with some people, some other peers, and then like suddenly, I found many instances I can actually put together and then when you have a number, you are stronger. And then uh, that's the comment part. So my question part is probably <laughs> this mural thing is very interesting. And I, I know it's a very particular to Chinese situation, the how the you know, people's life is dictated by and exploited by the state and so on and so forth, the party. But the, uh, I wonder, because mural is such a, kind of prevalent theme in from Mexico to, you know, like, a, and then also when you take a kind of non-professional person to practice art, then we can think about the way of visual culture working, you know, not professional artists working, and then so on and so forth. So the, like, a, I wonder if we can kind of expand your, you know, the discussion and think about not making it too special, but the, uh, trying to start connecting, you know, seeing, uh, oh, like, uh, you know, this might be similar. Of course, after saying that, you probably say, but this is dissimilar here. 
But you know, like seeing some similarity is not a bad thing. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, how should I respond? <laughs> um, yeah, because after pres after I presented, I I actually thought maybe I should also include um, like some comparative perspective, as you just mentioned, like. Um, primitive art, although during 1958, that was not the proper word to talk about the people's art. You, you should, um, no one was expected to call the art by the people as primitive, because primitive is such a, such a negative term. Um, I also thought of the term like informal, um, unformal, unformed art, that's uh, irrational and um, emotional sort of thing, formless, and I think you are absolutely right. If I can kind of incorporate all those sorts of things, that may make this very specific case not so specific. Yes, like you know, this morning, uh, Iftikar talk about uh, calligraphic abstraction and then like uh, to our uh, uh, inquiry, he said, yes, this is my invention or my construction yeah, to make bad. an art yeah. history. And yeah. then like, uh, yes, primitive may be a problematic word, formless, mm. informal, that might be. Uh, but you could create a space of your own discourse to think about this. You could reinvent. We've been talking a whole lot about terms today. Yes. Primitive, you know, if you could think about it. I think that's my wishful thinking. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I will definitely consider that. I want to return briefly to a discussion about cosmopolitanism and uh, the global and movement. And it seems to me that in much of our construction of the globality of the modern, we tend to privilege actual movement people going somewhere, or people coming back somewhere with something. Mm. Um, but there is also another dimension of the cosmopolitanism of imagination, right? Uh, which Pathometer Mita writes about. Uh, mm. and, and the particular artist that he's talking about, uh, not only did not leave India, they never even left their own towns. Mm. Yet there is a certain discourse of cosmopolitanism that is engendered through print capitalism, through the circulation of films, and in some ways, what comes to you via print is already unmoored from its original. Um, it, it, it's already flattened, its context is lost. You can, uh, creative misreadings become uh, far more viable. Um, I'm also reminded of a lot of work, contemporary work, um, on the display of Indian films or the popularity of Indian films in Soviet Russia. Um, and we do know that there were, there were circuits which were official, but it also creates a kind of a cosmopolis, cosmopolis of the imagination, right? So, so I wonder if, you, if, you, if in thinking about the modern and in thinking about transnationalism, um, we could think transnationalism from the local. We don't really need migration. We don't need movement. Hmm. Um, could I comment on that? Okay. Uh, I think cosmopolitanism is another one of the words at that level just below the serious level that I was mentioning before, like international modernity. I mean, if the term appears within the discourse at a particular um, point of battle, as Boris points out, if the term appears right there um, when we're looking back historically, then you've got to pay attention to it and understand why it's being used. Um, so you should not do what if it could did, invent an art historical term and apply it backwards. I totally don't agree with that. I mean, I agree with the enterprise of what he was doing, but not the way he named it. Um, and um, for me, it's always been the case that the, the word has to be in the discourse of the people who actually were trying to explain it at the time uh, um, that they had the problem to deal with. And international, you know, is crucial in uh, Central Europe at certain times and so on. So, but cosmopolitanism, 
is a term that had its uses in the early post-colonial days because in a certain sense there was an effort to rethink um, and repossess the cosmopolitan of the empire, the, the people who ran the empire, who took themselves to be cosmopolitans and who had compradors in all different parts of the world and they took themselves to be cosmopolitan. Um, it's got a longer history, I know, but it, you know. So, but, but when it's used more recently as a term for um, the kind of connectivity, critical connectivity and the, and the in, uh, kind of inventive freedom that we're trying to identify, that we tend to call modernist, it, I don't think it's going to carry it because even in the case of Pater Mitter, he has to invent this thing, virtual cosmopolitans. Right? That's his term, virtual, as if they were cosmopolitans. So when the term gets to the stretches that far, maybe let's think about another term. Yes, no, so, I agree. No, he, so it's he, very placed in the sense it's in the local. Yeah. Um, so there's a sense in which one is thinking about the yeah. global from the local. Right. Um, and there, is, there are also other ideas about cosmopolitanism that right. carries over through Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean literal, earlier trade yeah. networks. So yeah. I don't know why we tend to privilege Europe as, as that, that cosmopolis no, no, around no. which no. all our ideas need to be oh, organized. Okay. It's, a, it's, it's just because I have a, for me, terms around worlding and world making and world imagining, you know, they're in fact the more general set of terms. Um, and indeed, what was going on um, was a, a kind of world imagining, you know, imagining of world connectivity um, that um, you don't need to travel to have, yeah. So I think we agree in principle, I'm not sure about the, I think the term is running out of energy. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, worlding, world imagining, um, imagining of world connectivity. That's what, yeah. that's what I was trying to get at when I was trying to imagine a communist international right. that was, um, that yes. <laughs> we have to go back to that um, sort of earlier fire, question. Yes. Yeah. But <laughs> just that, that I, do, I do feel like there were these two competing worlds and that when we do talk about transnationalism, generally it is about modernism in sort of the, um, a capitalist world, but that it's really important for us to also consider well, what did that kind of world imagining look like in the communist world? And it's it's fascinating to me because I, you know, I, I don't know that much about it, and I have to, you know, just say to you right now that, um, yeah, I, I'd like to defer to the experts there. <laughs> But um, I do feel like there is something to be said and theorized, compared, contrasted. Yes, it's different, but there's something there. I, I don't want us to lose um, a lot of the huge topics we can take on when we have drinks outside. There are two questions, two burning questions. Um, so, and, oh, three. Okay, we do three and then we end. My question is. I have a very short question it's for Ming Tian oh, Pao. Oh, um, since your paper was on the transnational ah. history of modernism in Paris, I wanted to ask you what you thought of the Centre Pompidou's Modernité Plurielle. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that, as you know, it's not an exhibition, many of the works in the exhibition were, some were acquired recently, but many joined the collection actually more or less at the time of their production. Well, I think that this is a, a longer conversation that we all need to have together, um, and that's something you know I'd love to pursue with you. I actually just saw it um, two days ago, um, and the riri hanging. Yes, exactly. So I didn't see the original hanging. Um, obviously, the riri hanging is extremely problematic. Um, <laughs> the, the first uh, couple of rooms look like Magicien de la Terre, right? Um, and so that's not really on that's with bad. me. <laughs> Um, but I feel like there was, um, it's an ambitious project and I, I don't want to, you know, sh shoot them at the knees. I actually think that it's a really important thing for them to be thinking about and I want to contribute to a larger discussion about it. Um, why it is that they only had French scholars and French curators writing in the catalog about um, this kind of a global intervention is beyond me. Um, the fact that, you know, um, they're really opening up this kind of story of modern is something that I applaud the way that they did it 
I think that it, there could be some adjustments made. Um, so I think maybe um, I'll leave it there since we have, I'm keeping you from your drinks. Um, but uh, it's really something that I, I think we should really pursue in a, a larger discussion. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I have a question for Ming Tianpo too, and if I'm taking it into something completely off the path, please just smile and we can take it over drinks. But I was wondering how much um, you take into consideration the determining powers of the art market already at that time, and the art criticism which in Paris took a very unique path compared to other um, platforms or other uh, places at that time and the galleries and art dealers in the art market basically um, pushing artists into certain meetings and encounters and exchanges if that is at all something you came across and, and found evidence to as I said earlier, I'm at the very beginning of this project, so I could really only speak about Galerie Stadler, which I know well, um, because of my work on Kutai. And um, for sure, Stadler was very interested in seeking out artists from around the world. He was very much influenced by Tapier, by the same kind of internationalism and this desire to, to articulate a universalist art autre. I guess in his um, sense, it was more about um, just a kind of uh, universalist abstraction. Um, and you know, if you think about Paris at that in the, the even late 50s. Um, you know, Tachisme was already beginning to f fizzle out, and um, Tapie and um, Stadler were really looking towards Japan as a way of philosophically um, propping up Tachisme and Informel with a, a kind of um, more rigorous philosophical argumentation. So um, I think that it's clear that they were trying to bring these artists in for their own reasons. But what they did, what the artists did when they got there, is what interests me. Um. I'll be very short, yes. So this is a question about authorship or collective authorship. I'm trying to link um, the mentioning of uh, let's look at modernism perhaps without secularism or even before we completely became secular or the notion of folk art or the notion of um, I think what Atreyi mentioned how even at a local place to become cosmopolitan, you almost like imagine yourself with a stranger. So this, can we move away yeah, from sure, no, individual absolutely. authorship, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you do, uh, abs no, you're absolutely right. There's a constant, it goes back to the very first questions of, um, about being exceptional. Um, <laughs> without Jim, and I go back to, always to a comment of Simon Najami when he was trying to describe the experience of African artists during the period from the 50s through pretty much to the present as, um, as an experience of three different kinds of silence, one after another. The silence of those around you um, uh, is why you're an artist in the first place, to try and fill that silence. And then you go to another place, or if you can go to another place, or even in your imagination go to a place filled with other people who have this same kind of problem <laughs> that that you can share and but but also compete against, um, and then so that's the so-called inter international or the connected on on that model, the out of Africa on that model. But then then you uh, after that you realise the call, um, like a Vasario, the call, uh, the return. Um, that, that's empty, you know, that world has its huge resonance silences as well. Um, so, I mean, there's different kinds of artists and different kind of artistic conditions and we can't generalise across the whole board that I was suggesting we do because I think we need to be able to give accounts of, of um, the modern period, modern art, uh, and account for traditionalisms, neo-traditionalisms, indigenous developments, all of these things and their interaction, all of which have different um, internal psychic structures that they operate on, on individuals within them. And when we get into the deeper narratives um, of what's going on and where the 
where the work comes from, that's where we tend to end up focusing. So I'm, I'm hoping that that's what your question was about. And I think we need to sort of track, um, you're right, we absolutely need to track those through in detail and across all the larger levels that we're looking at. So that would be my answer. Yeah, yes. Well, I will, I will not comment on the Michel Tapier because that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow, I suppose. Oh, no. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's one thing. But I think what it would be interesting for us is just to say, well, to, well, for me, is that I'm trying to understand how things work everywhere. And in order to understand, you have to unpack, you have to kind of be not naive. Uh, about the art system, about the politics, and about all this. Mm. Uh, we have to kind of um, uh, never, in a sense, take literally si uh, sides, but of course we do as, uh, automatically because we cannot really uh, avoid with, this. To begin but with. I think what is important is to understand the situation in which uh, every country or every scene was uh, caught in and to clarify all this and to show the, to show the, 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 the different debate and battles that is going mm. on because mm. the art production is a battle and that's what I think is interesting. Right. So mm. I'm not, I'm not going to continue this because I can do it tomorrow. But no, no. Be, before, to finish, I would like to say <coughs> there is something that maybe we could also wonder is that why is it <coughs> that in a conference that talk about the wild world, uh, we all have to talk English. Okay, oh, is there time for one last comment? <laughs> There's a reason. Yeah. But not in English. So <laughs> I, I think this is really a comment maybe for Okui and cer I think certainly for all of us to consider over the next few days because I, I might be missing something and I am terribly jet lagged having flown in this morning and was in Hong Kong a day ago. But Aren't we missing political construction as the vehicle for these international imaginations? And we always equate that international imagination uh, with the Western world, with abstract expressionism, with triumphalism. But I think what we're learning and what I'm uh, so interested in this morning is that the non-aligned nations what were there, sort of 33 of them, uh, 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 com comprising one-third of the world population, if not one-third of the number of countries at that time, also had as an aspiration a driving ideology of internationalism, of transnationalism. Not necessarily of sameness, but certainly of universalism, and certainly in the communist bloc as well. And I think we need to understand and historicize these terms um, not only as lived experience of the artist, but as direct ideological directives that were constructed by these three different competing yeah. political ideologies that were backed by various powers. Um, obviously the non-aligned, least of all in the end, um, having been pushed aside by the U.S., I assume. But I just want to reintroduce a little bit, um, I mean, I kind of agree with Serge, there's a little bit of naivete going on here. I, I feel, uh, or I just would like more rigorous examination um, of the political constructs in which the artists are working and in which the movements are working and in which these ideals that they are ascribing to, signing up as agents of this big thing called post-war modernity, wh wh who is driving that ideal of universality? And also, what kind of universality are we talking about? Yeah, I think that's a really yep. important comment. Good point. Yep. Yep. We agree. Yep. <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's, it's, it's you. It's, it's a comment to Oh, no, you. it was for Ukwe. To you guys, you. so you're, please feel free. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm not making a comment. I'm just trying to moderate. Oh, you are. <laughs> we're agreeing, so we agree. we're agreeing. <laughs> There's nothing to moderate. Well, Alessandra, it seems like, yeah. Okay. <laughs>